Well, welcome. I realized I hadn't ever made a video where I described how to find the electric field inside of a solid sphere of charge. Now, and some of the other ones I have included a solid metal or conducting sphere, but those are a lot easier. What I have in mind here is a solid insulating sphere. And insulating means something like plastic. We sometimes call it a dielectric. And it's a, a situation where we can put charges evenly distributed through the entire interior volume. You can't do that with a metal because they always find their way to the surface. But an insulating sphere works a lot differently. So I'm going to approach this using Gauss's law um, because the calculus of this would be a mess. And if you don't know vector calculus, I'm not sure you'd have a whole lot of luck with this. So another great example of using Gauss's law. So I'm going to draw a cross section here of the sphere. Actually, let me show you what I would try to do if I could draw more three dimensional. You know, it'd be like filling the entire volume of that thing with charge. But it's a lot easier to take a slice and then we'll just put the charges uniformly distributed. And you notice on this diagram, it's hard to tell. If I hadn't told you what that was, you wouldn't know whether this was just a flat circle or a metal conducting sphere with the charges on the outside, or is this a, a slice through a solid plastic sphere? Now, what we're asking for here is at some spot, maybe right there inside, what would we expect the electric field to be? And we do have to have a couple parameters here. So let's say the amount of charge on the sphere is Q, and we would also need to know the size. So we'll call that the radius. I'm going to use capital R for the radius. And I'm using capital R there for that parameter. That's a fixed number, not a variable, because this distance here, obviously, could be a variable. I'm going to call that little r, because I could take that dot and say, well, what if I want to find the electric field further out, maybe out here somewhere, or maybe way close to the center in here somewhere? And so that little r and this big r are definitely different things. And so when we do Gauss's law, the first thing we always do is we draw a Gaussian shape that matches the symmetry of our charge and of our electric field. So spheres create this radiating inward or outward kind of a field, and that is what we call spherical symmetry. So that means we want to draw a sphere for our Gaussian shape. And that Gaussian shape should go right through the point that we are using to describe the electric field. So that would be this location here I drew with a dot. So I'm going to draw a cross-section of the sphere, and I always draw my Gaussian surfaces dashed. These are not real things. Like the sphere is very real. It's made of plastic. The Gaussian surface is just sort of an imaginary construct, we could call it, so that we can do Gauss's law. So that's what that looks like. I'd have a hard time drawing this sphere in 3D. I don't really quite know how I can tell 2D from 3D, but it's like a ball inside of a ball. Maybe that doesn't look too bad. And so when we do Gauss's law, first thing I always do is I write the symbolic equation for Gauss's law. This side over here is known as the flux. This side over here is the charge inside your Gaussian shape divided by the permittivity constant known as epsilon sub naught. Now, when we do Gauss's law, it always looks scary, like, oh, no, we've got to do this fancy calculus. But the whole idea of doing it is we only do it when the symmetry is so high that we don't really need to do the calculus. So here's the two things that are important. First, I've centered the Gaussian sphere on the center. That means no matter where I go on my Gaussian sphere, I would expect that the electric field would be the same. Whatever that is, it's going to be the same. And that's kind of what I'm looking for. So that means I can actually take E and pull it out of the integral because it's not really a variable. It's just some number. And then what do I have left? I have this, the sum, that's what integrals mean, the sum of all the little areas where I have flux. Well, on a Gaussian sphere, that would be the surface area of the sphere. And how big is this sphere? Well, it's 4 pi r squared. Don't confuse it with the volume of the sphere. We're not talking about that on this side. 
Okay. Oh, here's the other thing, and I almost let this go. The, the dot right there. That means we have to account for the direction of the electric field vector at every point and the direction of the area vector kind of pointed out from, from your surface. Well, I've chosen a sphere so that those are always lined up parallel with each other. And that means I don't need to worry about doing the dot product. I've already accounted for that by lining them up. So that's where our symmetry really helps us. Now, here's actually the hardest part of this problem. It's over here figuring out how much charge we have inside our Gaussian shape. It's important to notice that we don't have all of the charge. I cannot just write Q for my charge that's inside. So over here, I'm going to do a calculation for how much charge is inside. And I'm going to appeal to this, this spherical symmetry here. So the amount of charge, because it's uniformly distributed through the volume, is just proportional to however big these spheres are, the volume of each sphere. So I'm going to write it this way. The amount of charge inside the little Gaussian sphere is equal to the entire charge. Oh, I wrote this bad. Sorry. Qn equals the entire charge times the ratio of those two volumes, which is 4 pi little r. I'm sorry, 4 thirds pi r cubed. Now I'm using a volume for a sphere. 4 thirds pi little r cubed divided by 4 thirds pi big R cubed. That fraction right there is the fraction of the volume inside divided by the fraction of the entire volume. And that fraction will be the fraction of the, the big Q that's inside. So, of course, what happens here is 4 thirds pi cancel out, and you've got all the Q times little r cubed over big R cubed. So I'm going to put that in to the right side of the Gauss's Law equation. So I have Q times little r cubed over big R cubed, all over epsilon sub naught. And then, got a little sloppy here, I'm going to solve for E by dividing both sides by 4 pi little r squared. So now, I don't want to create, look, multiple denominators here. This is getting a little bit messy. I already have a denominator and a denominator. Those really should be grouped into one thing. And this is going to be divided over here and become also part of that denominator. So all I'm left with in the numerator is this Q and the little r cubed. And then here, I'm just going to put everything that's in a denominator. And yes, that is legal algebra. So I've got a 4, a pi, an epsilon sub naught. I've got uh, the little r squared, and I've got the big R cubed. And then do you see this? i got little r as both top and bottom. So these two will just cancel out two of those, leaving a 1. So my final equation, and I'm going to write it what you might think is a little oddly. I'm going to write the r kind of separated. We do this a lot because... I like to see that all this stuff is nothing but a parameters put together. It's just a number. So we can see the dependence on R. This is really significant. As R gets bigger, so does the electric field. If R is zero, so is the electric field. What that tells us is if we go up to the center of this charged ball, the field will be zero. Now, I don't think that should be too difficult to see. You're at a place there where every charge that's making a field they're all going to cancel each other out because of the, the symmetry, left, right, up, down, back and forth. And as we go outward away towards the surface of this, that field grows linearly. So it gets bigger and bigger as we go outward. It reaches its maximum right at the surface, and then, well, then we have a different expression. This only applies when R is less than big R. Okay? So there we go. Now, that again, that's one of the more complicated ones, only because of this little piece here, figuring out how much of your charge on the ball is actually inside your Gaussian surface. And without doing that step, there's no way we get to this. Okay. Once we get outside, actually it gets a lot easier, but there's other videos that I've made for that. So we're pushing the 10-minute mark here, and I don't like it going any longer than that. So I'm going to cut it off here. Hopefully that's helpful. You can ask questions of your teacher or me or whoever that happens to be. But thanks for watching. Hope this was helpful.